Good morning. It's an exciting time to be living, and I hope you realize that. For so many people, they're depressed and discouraged, worried, anxious about all sorts of things. But for the Church of God, for believers, it is one of the most exciting times, I believe, possible for us because God can come through and show you that what you say you believe, you can actually begin to believe. Uh, He's there for us, no matter what's going on. And the things that have been theoretical in our lives can really truthfully become reality in these times if we look to him. So I'm hoping you see it that way. Now, I feel very privileged uh, to be able to have this uh, opportunity to share the word of God with you. This is the second time since March last year that I've actually faced a congregation and preached them. I (laughs) preach about two or three messages a day, every week, right through the months. But I sit in my study or stand in my study and I preach to my iPad. And then I uh, I upload that around the world to wherever it's going to go. But to actually see people, instead of just a screen and myself, (laughs) is quite a new experience again for me. And yet I've been preaching for 50 odd years. It's like revival. (laughs) So thanks for showing up and being part of the iPad group. I appreciate it. I want to preach today, and I'm hoping I can get to the subject, but um, God just put some things in my heart after I had prepared the message I want to share with you about three or four days ago, and I had to ask Darren if he could just add a few scriptures to the beginning of what I had already given to them, hopefully that they'll put up there. But I want to preach on the subject of sowing and reaping, and unfortunately, sowing and reaping is, by and large, in the body of Christ, has been restricted and confined to finance. And in actual fact, that's one of the very small areas uh, that that sowing and reaping actually has to do with. With Just to jump ahead to to Luke chapter 6, it actually, um, don't read there. I just want to explain what I'm trying to say here. Luke chapter 6, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For the measure that you give, you shall receive, etc. That has been now made finance. But in actual fact, the forget, it's really about forgiveness. You read it for yourself whenever you do, and you'll see it's about forgiveness. So what I'm trying to say is that when I talk about sowing and reaping, there's 17 kinds of seed that I would like to talk about. Hopefully, we can get to some parts of them, that, of which I'd say 14 or 15 most Christians never, ever think about, but they're in the Word of God, and I'm sure there are lots more. So having said that, I want to just start by trying to help us to understand something that I have It's taken me years to understand as a preacher, and I'm hoping like that you can catch it. I doubt it, but here's go. Let's give it a go. Five or six important words every time you hear the Word of God preached, and every time you open your Bible, alone with God, or in a Bible study with people discussing the Word of God, there are five or six words that I reckon we need to understand, get a grasp of, see the importance of them, and see where we fit into these five or six words. All right. First one is information. Information. And I'm going to give you Dudley's definition of some of these words, if you'll just bear with me. Information, to me, is really a collection or accumulation of facts or fiction. Useful or useless? Good news or bad news? And we are being bombarded with information right throughout the day. Most of it useless, most of it bad, but we're being bombarded. And right at this moment, you are being informed. There's information coming to you. You say, well, that doesn't take rocket scientists. <laughs> well, we're going somewhere with this. The second word is revelation. Now, what do I mean by that? Once again, 
Well, let me just say this. Revelation that comes from God, before I tell you what I believe that is, revelation that comes from God causes inspiration. Now, those are two important words. Because revelation is God opening up things. Taking information and making it revelation. I want to stop for a moment and say this kindly. Very often on a Sunday or even when we're reading our Bibles, because if we've been around for a while in Christ, we know we need to spend some time with the Word of God. And so it can slowly just become a habit. Where we're getting some information by reading a few verses or chapters or whatever we do. But maybe for your own life, certainly in my life, quite often it's been where it's just remained information. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, etc. That, that's information, but until that becomes revelation, right. where the Spirit of God takes that and takes it from, you see, theologians have a little bit of a battle. Some people be believe that human, humanity is a dichotomy and some believe we're a trichotomy, body, soul, spirit. But some theologians feel like soul and spirit is the same thing. It's not. But I don't care what, what, which one of the two versions you believe in. It's not my business to try and change your mind on that. But here's the, pr the principle and the, the uh, truth I want to try and help you to understand. Is that if we get information, all information to some degree goes into our soul. Because our soul is what we're made up of. Its soul is our will, our affections. All those things that affect choices, etc. And it doesn't have to be by revelation to know that if somebody runs in here with a gun now and points the gun at my head and says, I'm going to kill you, there's a good possibility they're going to kill me. You don't need a revelation about that. Information is enough about that. But when it comes to the things of God, revelation is absolutely imperative because information will never hold us for long. Yeah. We'll never stay steady for long. Now, I'm hoping they'll put up the scripture that I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through to 15, wherever they put that up. And I'm going to read it from my Bible. I hope it's exactly the same as it is up there. But it says in Revelation chapter 2, picking up in the 19th verse. Sorry? Corinthians, did I say Revelation? My apologies. <laughs> Corinthians. <laughs> All right. The 10th verse says this. What, what did I put up from 10? Yeah, right, yes. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and neither has it entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for us who love Him. Now, God says it's not entered into the heart. Now, if you say the heart is just the the it's a soul part of us. That's where a problem begins to arise. Because what God's talking about when he talks about the heart is the part that is soul and spirit, where the spirit of God dwells in us and is able to do something in the soul with what's there. So it's a combination of soul and spirit when we talk about heart very often. It's not just a mind but the mind so often is included in the heart, in the scriptures. Now, bear this in mind. When we're talking about God, we're talking about the Word of God. God is using... Now, let's just take the attributes of God. The attributes of God are never exactly what God is. The language that you and I can understand... And God trying to get the truth about himself to us in terms we can understand. And so the attributes of God. God is always bigger, yeah. huger, more than any attribute. Yeah. Do you understand that? Yeah. Some whole religious movements have felt like God is like a chicken. Because he, he, he takes us and he covers us with his feathers. I mean, God doesn't have feathers. 
It's like God's trying to explain to us by His Spirit, this is something about what I'm trying to communicate to you about myself. Yeah. Oh, you, I hope you understand. Yeah. Every time you read the Word of God, you've got to understand that this Bible is trying to help you and I to understand. And without the knowledge of the Spirit of God in our lives, we'll never get it. And so some people will come onto this church on a Sunday, they'll get something... And they'll go out full of something called, they think, joy. Not the joy necessarily of the Holy Spirit or the joy of the Lord. They'll get something and because what? They got inspired. But what that really was was motivated, not inspired. And we call it inspiration. I got really inspired. So lots of people come to meetings on a Sunday to get motivated, to keep them for the next week. If that's... What you get out of a Sunday meeting, you're in serious trouble. And so am I. If Darren preaches the worst message in the world, or I do today, or whoever's preaching, it makes absolutely no difference if you let the Spirit of God... Now, I'm not excusing bad preaching. If I preach bad today, and I keep bad preaching every day, then you've got to say, I've got to go and find somewhere where they actually preach the truth. Are you with me? I'm making no excuses, but at the same time, I'm trying to take excuses away from us, not only the preachers. (laughs) You there? Hmm. All right, so, I knew I was going somewhere with that, and I've forgotten just quite where I was going, but we'll come back to it. Let's read on. So, no no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But then it goes on and says, but God has revealed these things to us, how? By His Spirit. What does it go on to say? Because it says the Spirit of God, this Spirit here, the Spirit of God searches all things, even the deep things of God. Those are the mysterians, the the mysteries, the things that are not understandable to the human mind without the impact of, of the Holy Spirit. So you hear, God loves you, for God so loved me, and you walk out saying, God loves me, but if you don't get that, where the Spirit of God puts that and takes it beyond information, beyond your soul, into the spirit soul, it won't be long before you'll be doubting whether God really does love you. Something goes wrong, and you think, God can't really love me. If God loved me, why would He allow this? Why? We didn't get revelation. When you get revelation, it's something about revelation that is stickable. It stays there. It's hard to get rid of it. Demonic attacks don't in any way diminish it. Are you with me? Is this being helpful or not? Because I'll move away quickly if it's not. You know, one of the problems, and I think Darren must have this, and all these guys as they developing across, Leon sitting at the back. Those of us who've been preaching, we can preach for days, yeah. <laughs> and it's dangerous. <laughs> all right, reading on. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man within him? And then it goes on and says, says in the same one, no one knows. The thoughts of God, except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of who is from God. Why? Now, this is so important. That we may understand. That we may understand. I understand one and one is two. I don't need revelation for that. I'm making a point. You'll see it come out in the Scripture in a moment. Four and four is eight. Don't need revelation for that. But to understand spiritual things, spiritual truth, it's not enough to read your Bible. It's not enough to even become a theologian. It's not enough even to go to a theological college, a university. If you don't get the here, and that's the wonder of it all, you don't have to do all that. You've got to just understand Something of what God wants to do for you, that information must become revelation. Very good. Very good. Thank you. I'm hoping you understand that. Let me read on. 
that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now watch this. This is what we speak. Not in words taught by us by human wisdom. But in words taught by, please shout it out, the Spirit. So today, the Spirit of God needs to teach you. If you're hearing Dudley's words, even though they're part of the Word of God, and the Spirit of God isn't allowed to be able to teach you, and that's where sowing and reaping starts. Because the first place that we need to sow is the Word of God into our own hearts. And the only way you can sow that is to open your heart to anything and everything that God wants to say to you every single time you open your Bible or hear a message preached that's got the Word of God. Are you listening to me? Which means you can't pick and choose. That's the good news for most, and it seems to have become bad news for some. You just cannot pick and choose. <laughs> I appreciate a little bit of a whisper. Good, Dudley. But occasionally it's nice to hear, Amen, Dudley. <laughs> amen, I know. You know, South Africans, they say, I know. It means, oh, that hurts. <laughs> but an amen is always appreciated. I'm sure these preachers would say the same. All right, but it, in, he taught words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept. Very good. Does not accept. Does not. You see, sitting here and you're not letting the Spirit of God work in, you will not accept what the Scripture says. You can come here every Sunday. Even if we had five Sunday services and you came to all five, you, you will never get it if you, do, if you don't allow the Spirit of God to work. Are you catching it? You can read your Bible all day and get absolutely nothing out of it but information. Now, I'm taking too long on the second word and the third word. I haven't even got to the third one yet. I mentioned it, inspiration, but reading on. For they are foolishness to him. Now, listen to me, folk. When you say no to what God wants... You really are saying that's foolish. Because if you didn't believe that was optional, and it's only optional if it's foolish, if you knew this is imperative, and any man who does not believe it's imperative what God says God means is a fool. Any woman, any child, any preacher. <laughs> Suddenly we're not breathing. For they are foolishness to man, he cannot understand them. Because they are spiritually discerned. Now, the word spirit today involves the occult, the new age movement. I'm a spiritual person because I'm in the occult. I'm a spiritual person because I'm in the new age. To be spiritual... Is, has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with God's Spirit making us spiritual. And without that, you are not spiritual. You can accept what the world says, but I'm saying accept what God says. Now, I, I'm taking... Uh, some of this I didn't come here intending to preach on, but I've learned over the years that if you get stuck somewhere generally and you want to move on and you can't, it's normally God saying something's happening. Now, the spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Now, I love this. For who has known the mind of, 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 of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What an incredible... Now, the true, we should never use that word incredible about God because incredible means I, I, you can't believe it. And everything about God we can believe or should. But I'm using it in the context of it, it's like beyond my wildest dream. 
I have the mind of Christ. No matter what comes my way. When, when all of the above, the above is involved in my life. Bringing revelation. Psalm 119 verse 130. I just want to quickly read it. The unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding. It's the word of God. The spirit of God is only going to give you revelation from things that are in the word of God. If I suddenly come here as Dudley or a preacher or any one of us comes here and tells you something and it's not in the word of God. It's the word of God. And the spirit of God only bears witness with the, with the word of God. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, etc. 2 Timothy 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. I hope we can get that up there. All scripture is God breathed. Yeah. All scripture is God breathed. That really, God breathed is inspired. What is inspiration? Because I'll just touch this and move on. Because inspiration is really the communication of will, ideas. If I want to inspire you, I try to communicate with you my will, my ideas, so I can get you to cooperate. The devil's always trying to do it. Your humanity is trying to do it inside of you. But God is also trying to communicate his will, his ideas, so that you respond to it. That's biblical inspiration. So, reading on from there. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Let's move on. I'll look it up in my Bible. Sorry? That's it. So that the man of God, I don't know if he said every, but so that the man of God may be fully equipped. Fully equipped. That When it's got man there, it's not talking about a male. It's talking about us. Boys and girls, you don't have to be grown up because a grown up is a man. A child is not a man. It's talking about all of us. So don't bump your wife, your husband and say, oh, that's for you, God, not for me. <laughs> all right, moving on quickly. The next word I want to talk about, so we've got information, revelation, inspiration, which I didn't spend much time over, and the next one is impartation. And I've semi-touched that. Impartation. When we get information, and it becomes revelation, and that becomes inspiration for why I want to respond, it's then that God imparts to me. An impartation is if I've got something and I say, I'm going to give this to Darren, when Darren takes it, it's imparted. And that's why it says in the scriptures, don't be too hasty to lay hands on people. Why? Because it's an impart. Something comes from one into another. And the Spirit of God takes the things of God and He imparts them into our soul. Go back to this thing of the Spirit. Into our soul and spirit mix. Where the Spirit of God takes, comes and hits all that's in the heart with His power. He imparts to us truth. I often try to say to pastors, don't be too quick in releasing people into leadership that they haven't got the impartation of what comes with leadership. You frustrate the man or the woman. You frustrate the people that they're trying to impact. We've got to have an impartation. But the beauty is this, that everything in the Word of God that's for all of the body of Christ, God wants to impart all the time to all of us as we open our hearts to Him. By giving him, Father, take this. I want it to be good soil. My heart is where it all starts. Hoping I can get back to that somewhere. Impartation. 1 Peter 1 4 tells us this. We are all made partakers of his divine nature. How? Through the promises of God. He's given to us exceeding great and precious promises. And through them, 
We are made partakers of His divine nature. You can look at 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12. I'm not going to look it up, but if they put it up there while I move on quickly, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12. Because I want to get to the next little word, and that's the word transformation. Transformation. See, when you get information, and it becomes revelation, and inspires you to move with and motivates you, when it, and then, then it becomes to, uh, that you, you receive the impartation, there has to be a result. If any one of those is missing, that are those four words, is missing, this one never takes place in people's lives. So every Sunday, every one of you who comes here every Sunday, every Sunday you're getting some of those things to some degree. But not every one of you is getting, well, when I say everyone, I'm talking about me as well. Not every one of us is being transformed by that truth. So many people, if you're honest with yourself, and I'm, I'm honest, if I'm honest with myself, we can come to church, sit to you there, listen for all that time, do all the things that are going on in the meeting, and go home, and actually not, nothing's changed. And we'll, some people have been doing that for not only years, decades. There's got to be transformation. And the Word of God tells us, first of all, I've got it in the order that's different to, to what I gave you, whoever's handling that little overhead there. Transformation, Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says this, we are predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ or into the likeness of Christ. That's transformation. When you're no longer being conformed to the world, which I want to read in a moment, Romans 12, 1 and 2, but where you're being transformed through the renewing of your mind, that you begin to come, become more like Jesus. So every time you open your Bible, I don't know how much the adjustment will be. For some, it can be on some, on, and anyone and everyone. It can be one day, it may be just, with just that much. Another day, it's bow. But every time we take the Word of God and we let God have these, His way in these words, we're going to actually be transformed. To become a little more like Jesus. Now I hope that doesn't scare you. I hope that makes you hungry. And you say oh my God. I didn't realize what I'm doing. When I just sit there. And I watch. I pick up my little iPad. Or my little iPhone. And I start texting people. Trying to find out the result of the footy match. While we're having a meeting. You say Dudley those done things don't happen. Hey I've been around for a while man. Those things more than happen. And you'll be surprised who does it. Many of them look so spiritual. From the moment we start singing, their hands are up there. They're giving it a full go, flat out. I want to tell you something. Most, not you. <laughs> Most people that laugh at what you're saying on these things, and that's why I often laugh because we're so guilty of it ourselves. <laughs> now, don't let that stop you from laughing, please. But let's go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 on this thing of transformation. Because I'm going to... I didn't know how to put this up, but I'm going to ask them to, to put up from verse 3 afterwards through to, I think it's 7, verse 7 or 8, because it's really important. But I want Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Paul says this under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He says, I beseech you, I, I, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present what? Your body. Now your body is lock, stock and barrel, the total you. Body, soul and spirit. Your soul is in here and your spirit are in here. It's you. The entire Dudley. The entire whoever you are. Present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice. Alive. Holy. Acceptable unto God. Which is what? Your reasonable service, your reasonable act of worship. Different translations. All meaning the same thing. And that you be not conformed to this present world. But be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. What renews your mind? The Bible, yes, but not without the power of the Spirit of God. You can memorize Scripture till the cows come home. And your mind's not renewed. You can quote Scripture. You can shout it. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I am more than conqueror through Christ. You can shout it till the cows come home. That will not renew your mind. Accept the Spirit of God. That you respond. Now I'm saying, I'm not saying don't do that. Because I do sometimes. But if you only do it in front of people, something's wrong. Can I just say this? This is just me being naughty again. And I've said it for years. People that have known me for 20, 30, 40 will know. If you just raise your hands here on a Sunday, what you're doing is performing. You don't do it at home. If you, you know, jump around and do the charismatic kind of grasshopper hop, dance thing here and not at home, if it's a performance, people are watching me. So I'm going to show them how good I am at God. Do you do it at home? Now, that was just a naughty. Sorry. I just, don't you dare do that again, Dudley. All right. What did I get to? Do not conform to this present, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God's will is good. Everything God wants you to do, everything God wants me to do, and everything God wants us as a church to do, if we could just see this. Now, remember what I've done. Remember what I've just said. The church, because we're coming to that, and this is the forgotten factor of those who love those first two verses. But everything that God wants for us is good, and I want to tell you it has no room for improvement. It's perfect. It's something like me. Now stone me, come on, man. At least you're awake. <laughs> you know I'm beyond, beyond imperfect. It's to the nth degree of imperfection. But it's good and acceptable and it's perfect. When it isn't acceptable, what's gone wrong? Some of those things that I've mentioned beforehand has come unglued, been thrown out. Information becoming revelation, etc., etc. You there? And then, if uh, let me just quickly turn to Romans chapter twelve. Oh, you're going to, if you would mind putting up those uh, those extra few verses there, I would, I'd appreciate it, please. I just felt after I'd sent this to you that I couldn't phone Darren again and say, "Would you change it again?" So I thought I'll just come here and, and uh, read it for myself. Romans twelve. So then you will be able to test and approve what is God's good, perfect, and ple good, or His pleasing and perfect will of God. Now, look, watch this. Because from that it moves from me, Dudley, from you, Ange, what, Deb, whatever your name is, it moves from you to us. And us is the church. Yeah. Want that to sink in? Because God doesn't want need to present my body to him and then go and hide away in a mountain. So I avoid temptation, conflict, people who don't like me. Let me say this to you, folks. If you've got a heart like I have, I hope it's better than mine, but I have a heart to serve God and please God in everything I do. If you've got that kind of heart, you're going to run into conflict. You're going to get criticized. You're going to have people speak about you, not nicely. If you don't want that, back off, hide away. You'll still get some, but you won't get as much. If you can't avoid it. But if you want to count for God, you're going to get criticized. Be willing. He'll give you grace because His will is good, acceptable. It's, it is accept, it's pleasing. All right. So, now it moves from me to us, from you to us. Watch this. 
He says here in Romans 12 now, and we pick up in verse 3. For the grace given me, I love that, because grace has got so distorted. For the grace given me, I say, by the grace given me, every one of you, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. The church is full of self-opinionated people. I know, but you know what? It is incredible to me. People tell me how I should be preaching and what I should be doing. And when I stop and have the courage to say, how many people have you led to Christ in your whole life? It's like something got stuck inside there. I hear pastors telling me what I should be doing, and I ask them, how many churches have you ever seen really become effective for God? I get challenged almost every Sunday that I preach. For years, when I was the visionary pastor, I get out of the pulpit, we're up on the hill and elsewhere around the world, and as I get out, guys are there with their notes. I want to correct you on something, bro. And I've got to sit there and, um, you know, when you've preached a message, you've preached your heart out. You can get tired. Jesus got tired. And then you've got to put up with some expert who's never done a thing trying to correct you. It's incredible, man. But it happens all the time. You know? You're saying, Dudley, you want to get out of that door as quick as you can. You're right. Here I go. <laughs> All right, so moving on as we read this. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, listen, in accordance with the measure of faith that God's given to you. And then he goes on and you say, this is not church. Well, wait a minute, let's read on quickly. Just of, as each of us has one body, this is my body, but many members, fingers, toes, head, ears, eyes, things you can't see, many members. And these members do not all have the same function. Well, here we've got the, the immensity of the body of Christ. You'll see that this is referring not just to Dudley's body or your body. It really is the church. It's immense. Do you know that? Do you, I don't know if you realize this, that the church is bigger than this. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Even when it's full to overflowing, and if we had people standing outside, if we had people on the streets, if we had all of Adelaide come here and get born again today, the church is still bigger than that. Come on. That's right. The church is immense. Don't you thank God we belong to the biggest thing on the planet? There's nothing as big. It's from time to time, to, from eternity to eternity, eternity, right throughout all of, all of time. You are not some little guy or girl that's sitting in a corner having to hide from being exposed as a Christian, found out. Sometimes I wonder about my own life. If I was actually put under trial to being a Christian, how much evidence would be prove it? I hope you, you hear what I'm trying to say there. <clears throat> Am I taking too long here, Darren? No. Elders, please help me here. Let's go on then. So, and, and, and all of these members do not have the same function. So in Christ... We who have, are many, form one body. The Baptists down the road, the Methodists, the Anglicans, those that are born again in those churches, and only those that are born again in this church, not all of us. Only those of us who are born again in this church are part of the, this church that Jesus is talking about, that he's building. And that's the only church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. 
everything else, then the devil's tearing them apart. And so he goes on, he says, and each, this I love, and I'm asking you, please, Father, ask him, Father, will you please give me a revelation on this? Please, let this not just be information. Let this be a revelation that transforms me. Because I haven't come to the last little word, and that's participation, and this is the beginning of that. But I'll come back to that, because our time really is flying now. So, And each member belongs to all the others. Do you understand that you belong to me, and I belong to you? I'm trying to find someone I don't like here. I just can't find anyone. <laughs> Because if, I, if, this, if this person, if there was such a person standing here, this person I could not stand, and there are some people in the body of Christ we really have some real struggles with. I know that some of you have a struggle with me. If you don't, you're amazing. But anyway. <laughs> but that guy, with all of his problems and the way he just gets on my nerves, I belong to him and he belongs to me. And I want to tell you that the stuff in my home and your home too for you, you come and try and take that stuff. It belongs to me. This woman belongs to me. You come and try and sneak off with her and see what happens. <laughs> see these big, huge muscles? Uh, I flex them and... You know what I'm trying to say though? We all belong to one another. This is church. You see, if you say, well, i got revelation from God, and you don't want to be involved in the life of the church, something is deception in your life. And it's normally self-deception inspired by demonic deception. I'll come when I like. There are more important things for me than coming to church. Look, sometimes that's true even for my own life. I feel like, man, it's the last thing I feel like doing. But I don't just belong to myself. And generally, if I can't come, it's because I've been sick or something really has cropped up. But we just, in and out, breeze, we kind of breeze in Christians. Cool, man. I want to tell you, we need to move from being cool to being red hot. Stop trying to be cool, man. Peace, you know. Some people are living in this dream world that's gone. It was never really there. It was always just a... Anyway, we'll let me move on. Re reading on. I, look, I'm just being naughty. Will you please just forgive me? Just say, God, I forgive him. Help him get back on track. All right. We have different gifts. I'm called to preach the gospel. I'm called to do certain things within the, the preaching of the gospel. But others are called to do other things. And I want to tell you, you, from the church, teaches a hierarchy. That if you get called into full-time ministry to be a preacher of the gospel, you have arrived. But can you imagine getting these four elders with their wives, and Ann and I, and Leon and Pat, because I know we have our people who have been called, there may be others in here, Getting the, the few of us, and all we do all day is just preach. How much will get done? Eventually, everybody would be sick of our, our voices, including ourselves. We've all got different gifts, and every gift, it goes on to say, every gift is absolutely needed. That useless little old lady who can't even move properly, if her gift is praying, Or baking an occasional little cookie for someone. Come on. Or a pat on the back. Or a word of encouragement. It's as essential and as important in God as the preaching of the Word of God. There is no hierarchy in ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Now you say, oh, I believe that. But do you? Yeah. By revelation. If you do, there would be participation. Yeah. You'd be doing it. 
I came here, I asked God, and God hearing me, I asked God, help me please to just be gentle and kind. <laughs> not get excited, and I'm already blowing it. <laughs> Can we read on, please? This is really taken, I mean, I'm not even going to get to the, to the Matthew 13 that I was going to be where I start. <clears throat> Just as each one of us has one body with many members, I want to just pick up on this again, and these members do not have all, have all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use Now, it mentions a few gifts here, but they're more than this, if you go through the Word of God. If, the, if it's just encouraging people, let that person use it. If it's baking cakes for those that are in need, let them use it. And I'm in desperate need. And that's a joke. I'm not even allowed to eat cake, really. <laughs> but if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is teaching, let him teach. Let him, let her, let them. Let them. Church is about letting them. That means you say, I'm going to do it. Now, if you fall into the trap of most Christian churches of thinking these guys have to tell you what you can do, you are not going to be walking in the revelation that God has for you. If you say it's only got to happen in this church, it can happen in the streets. It can happen in your neighborhood. It can happen anywhere. Now, you'll not go against what they're standing for and trying to be a rebel. I'm not talking about that. But if you're waiting for them to give you an opportunity... What you don't use, you lose. What you do, I mean, that's scriptural. That Jesus, look at the time. <clears throat> we will come to an end within the next five minutes. Please, check your watch and put up your hand and start waving when we get there. <laughs> if it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let them govern gen diligently. If it's showing mercy, let them do it cheerfully. You know, when, you, when one of the hardest times to show mercy is when somebody has been unkind to you. Oh, so you did that. Mm, uh, well, I'll show you mercy. <laughs> cheerfully. One Corinthians chapter three verse nine tells us we co-labor us together with Christ. Participation, where we become involved. Now, this is where I will finish. What's going to take place in your life? Or what has taken place in your life this morning? And what's going to take place in your life this coming week? When you take the word of God, when you come back next Sunday. You see, if you're only gathering information, you'll soon dry up. Now, I'm going to have to be very careful because I'm watching people here, and I've been an advocate of this myself, and Darren actually said something, and I said to Anna, coming to the meeting this morning, something that I thought, oh, Darren said that's going to make it harder for me to say this. But you've got to please listen to me. I've, all, I've been an advocate of taking notes. And I reckon it's good to take some notes. But if those notes only become information you got onto an iPad or to a little tablet or whatever you're using or on a piece of paper, if you don't go home with that, you see, what I'm trying to say is that by taking notes, in actual fact, you're stopping revelation from taking place at the moment that it's happening. Now, I'm still, I still take notes on some issues. So please hear me that I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
But I'm saying that it can become a hindrance. And you know whether it is. If you can take these notes and you know you're getting impartation, not just information, then keep taking notes. But if, you don't, if you're not going to go home and let God make it revelation, stop taking notes. And what did Dudley say? Think it through. Because most of you will end up with something I'm not saying. So if you only gather information, you'll soon dry up, you'll grow, listen to the progression, yeah? Not only will you dry up, you'll grow cold. And you'll begin to wither. And you'll begin to find fault. You'll begin then to criticize. And ultimately, you'll leave. want that to sink in. You leave. And most people that leave and go and say any bad word about the church they've left, that process has happened. Now God can call you to leave and go somewhere to plant another church or whatever. But if you go out and criticize and justify your leaving, by making those that you left look bad. This process has found a hole that the devil's... You see, there's a hedge around all of us, but the devil can find holes if we make them. He, I can't create a hole in your life through the hedge. God's put a hedge around all of us. Job, the book of Job tells us that. But you can start to make a hole in the hedge and then the devil will come in. You with me? So, your life's a field and God gives you seed. And the seed needs to start here and the seed starts with being the Word of God. It's more than that. But will you stand with me now? And let's just pray together. If you'll close your eyes, I just want you not to be thinking of other people for a moment. I just want to say something to you. That I'm not a great advocate of people raising their hands and responding in meetings. Uh, sometimes it's needed. But I've been around for 50-something years. And I've seen that many of the people who raise their hands in a meeting do it Sunday by Sunday. They come out over and over on the same things. So I really am not one of the big advocates of raising your hands but I also want to say that I'm feeling today that you need to let the devil know give him notice today things are going to change I don't know how they'll change I can't grit my teeth and say I'm going to do things I'm going to just open my heart and say Father I want this little heart of mine to be good soil I want it to be fertile soil Soil that brings forth a harvest of a hundredfold. And I'm asking you to give the devil notice. So before I pray, put your hand up. I'm going to close my eyes. You put your hand up and say, devil, I'm giving you notice. God has spoken to me today and I'm responding. And I'm looking to God and God alone. For I know I'll fail if God doesn't step in. So Father, in Jesus' name, for every person who raised their hand, even if they're holding them up or put, it, or put them down, for everyone, I ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Revelation, will bring about transformation because we know that the transformation comes as the Spirit of God works in us. Where your Spirit is, there's liberty, there's freedom. We want to be like Jesus. Will you make your people, help them, make them what they want to be in Christ, that they see in your Word, and let this week... And the weeks ahead and the months ahead and the years ahead be so good for us as we become more and more like Jesus. And if we fail on some issue, please help us to quickly repent, confess it and move on and not to give up. Bless your people and bless our church, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Jesus, lover of our souls, our